So the first thing you want to do when you get on a roof is get an eave measurement. And the reason for this is so that we know how deep the eave goes into the house to make sure that when ice and water is applied to the roof, it's applied in the proper amount. Getting that shot is relatively easy. Get up to the eave height, get out your trusty tape measure, run it up underneath the edge, get your iPad in position, and take the shot. The next thing you need to do is get a picture of layers, drip edge, and starter strip. It's relatively simple. It's the very first run or row of shingles. You simply lift it and find out how many layers do you have and do you have actual starter strip or did they just cut a shingle backwards and apply it as starter strip, which it appears they did here. As you can see, you only have one layer of shingles here and then you drip edge. While you're here, you'll note that this particular rain gutter is installed correctly. It is just below the drip edge, not through the drip edge, but you'll want to look for that as well, as long as you're right here. So once you're on a roof, you want to take a minute and get a layout, get a lay of the land as it were. The last thing you want to do when you're on a roof is be scattered. You should be methodical. You should do every step the same every time. So check all your slopes, figure out where the bulk of your damage is and start there. Figure out what potential hazards might be up there because what last thing we want for you is injury while you're on a roof. Getting pictures of the roof before you get started, actually marking up the roof is useful because, well, quite frankly, you wanna make sure that the roof is in the same condition when you're done as when you started. And the best way to be able to show that is getting pictures before you get started and pictures after you're finished. Getting pictures of the roof starts by going to the edge of whatever gable you're on and getting a picture or getting pictures of a panorama of 180 to 360 degrees depending on the layout of the roof. And you simply take a shot, 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 take a shot. And it's that easy. And now you've got a 180 degree view of this end of the roof. When you take photos, you wanna go ahead and get uh, at least 180 and sometimes 360. It just kind of depends on the layout of the roof. The next thing you're gonna do is find a safe place for your iPad. And I would recommend you put it someplace shady. Right now we're working in the middle of February, which isn't a big thing. But in July, it's gonna be, well, it's gonna be really hot up here. And if your iPad is out where the sun will get it, it will overheat. And that's gonna slow down the process. So tuck it someplace where the shade is because you're not gonna need it for the next little while. The next little while, what we're gonna work on is actually locating and inspecting damage. I don't wanna be clear on this. Our job is to inspect for damage and you have to be careful how you do that. So let's get to that. Sure. 
So the first thing you want to look for is fractured or creased shingles. Fractured like this, where you can see it has actually broken, or this is also an actual break. A crease shingle is going to look more like this one, and you can see there is clearly a crease in the shingle, but the shingle itself lays flat and doesn't appear to be loose. You can see this line right along here. You'll make note of all the damage that is obvious. And then you'll start looking for slightly less obvious damage. And this is the part that can take a few minutes because you really want to be thorough. You want to go over the whole roof. If all I have is one or two broken shingles, it's probably not worthy of, a, of an insurance claim. But if you have many broken shingles, some that are missing outright, some that are flipped up, and some that are creased, well, then it's worth doing. But in order to know how many you have, you're gonna have to go pretty methodically over the roof and make sure that it's, well, make sure what its condition is. And to do that, the easiest way to do it is with a uh, tackle knife. Now, be clear on this, how you use this matters. We are not here to create damage. We're here to document damage. So what you're gonna do when you're looking for damage is you're gonna locate the seam between shingles. And that typically is gonna be either wider than the other tabs or narrower than the other tabs. In this case, it is in fact wider. And over time, you're gonna get really good at spotting that. That's where you're gonna look because that's where you're gonna find zippering, which isn't wind damage, and pull-throughs, which is. And we'll go over this. The way to look for it is you take your knife and you get underneath the shingle. Now, you don't wanna yank up on it and break a seal. If you find that it is sealed down, leave it alone. The leftmost edge almost never is, so you just gingerly check. Is it loose? This shingle is completely loose. So when I lift it here, the whole thing lifts. That's not wind damage, by the way. Just to note that it is loose. And you work your way up the shingle, trying to find, is there any zippering or actual wind damage? And zippering would be this exact phenomenon. These shingles are all starting here. It is actually loose, but, and this is why it's not wind damage, the nail is still attaching the shingle to the roof. So this is just zippering. And over time, it's gonna be a problem because this is more susceptible to wind. It is not actual damage at this point. So you move on from this. When you're looking, you're looking for actual, well, creases like this one right here. This shingle's actually fractured. So that's damaged shingle. And you'll wanna make a note of that and mark it with a big fat X like this. Oh, huh, isn't that interesting? That's that install. There it is. All right. <laughs> nope. And you'll note, when I lift here, the whole shingle doesn't move, so I stop. Because if I lift the whole thing, I break this seal, it's not good for the roof. Versus this one, where it lifts freely.
So here's a field of damage that's fairly extensive. You have broken or fractured shingles where the shingle itself is missing. In some cases, you'll find that shingle on the roof. Be, be careful of that. Leave it where it is. Don't step on it. That can be dangerous. You'll find other shingles that are attached, but are clearly starting to crease. And then shingles that are attached and not only creasing, but are actually beginning to split. When you find a shingle like this that is beginning to now split, you'll want to mark it with an X. When you find missing or fractured shingles of any kind, if the shingle has fractured or it is been torn off, that gets an X. So what we have here are fractured shingles. We actually have several of them. What causes a fracture is the wind blows the shingle loose and then over time it works it back and forth, creates an ever-growing crease in the shingle until eventually that crease becomes a uh, split and the shingle tears off and then you have shingles missing. These shingles have obviously torn away, but you also have shingles like this one here. This is a fracture now. It's actually starting to split down here at the end. This one over time will work its way absolutely loose, but this shingle is fractured at this point. This one is now damaged. You mark all fractures with an X, whether the shingle is just breaking or is completely broken. You put a big X in it to denote that that shingle is failed. The idea is that every shingle that is fractured or missing should be both marked and photographed. This is how you document damage on a roof. Photographing fractured shingles is relatively simple. You get your iPad, you take your photographs in landscape mode. From about two feet away, you take a picture of each fractured shingle. So every X that you've put down, you get a photograph of. Then you can get up close to actually show where it's creasing. So lift the shingle a little bit, take a picture to show where that crease occurred and let it down. In the case of one that's already broken off, you can get up close again. The idea is that every shingle that is fractured or missing should be both marked and photographed. This is how you document damage on a roof. All right, so I've got to pull through here. That's nice. And then let's see but not here. Okay. So we've got an interesting situation here where we do actually have a pull through. And I know we have a pull through because of two things. When I lift this shingle, it lifts this shingle. You want to get closer? When I lift the corner of this shingle, it actually lifts this entire shingle, which tells me this shingle is no longer attached. So when I get down underneath and I just look, I can lift this and actually see that that nail is no longer uh, holding the shingle down, it has actually pulled through. This is the nail, and when you lift this, you can see right there. One good way of showing that a pull through is a pull through and not an overdriven or a blow through is actually using a dime. And what you do is you slip the dime up next to where the nail is. If the dime can slip underneath the nail, the nail hasn't been overdriven. If the dime can't slip underneath the nail, then it's an overdriven nail and that's an installation error, not wind damage.
And if you look underneath here, you can see that the actual nail is above the lower shingle. So it is not overdriven. This has actually been wind removed. The wind blew this shingle up and tore it off of its nail. This shingle is no longer fastened to the roof on this corner. This one gets a line through it, denoting damage of a pull through variety. While we're right here, let me show you what is just zippering from that same angle. When I lift this shingle, you note the shingle above it does not move. And when I look from down below, that nail is still perfectly attaching this shingle. So this shingle is not wind damaged, but there is sort of a zipper effect happening here. But the only pull through that I found on this run is right here. In this case, the whole, both shingles move. In this case, only this shingle moves. And that is repeated up the line. So when we see a little bit of movement, let's take a look. I suspect this one is not, and I am correct. This one is also not a pull through, just the way things are laying. It wants to sort of lift it, but it's just a zipper and it needs to be left alone. This one isn't even loose. You note when I lit, it doesn't move at all. Whereas this, the whole shingle lifts. So if you were to come across and put your putty knife here, stop. The shingle isn't giving. Do not drive your putty knife in there. Do not cause extra damage. That's not helpful. In fact, it could be considered vandalism. We don't do that. The thing about the tools that we use is that you do have to be careful using putty knife because you can easily go from revealing damage to causing damage. But the reason you use a putty knife, uh, the shingles will destroy both your gloves and your hand where it doesn't damage the putty knife. And the putty knife can be used to great effect without damaging the roof. Nope. Documenting a pull through can be a little more challenging because it's not as obvious what's going on. And you actually have to get up under the shingle in order to show what has happened. When you locate a pull through, you mark it with a line across the shingle. But to photograph it, you'd get a picture of that line. And then you actually have to get down at the level of the pull through and you separate the shingle and you get up under there. So you have to get right down on the deck and then you want a picture of that nail to show that it is no longer in the shingle. There we go. Documenting a pull through in the, in the later part of the day is very challenging because the sun will have a tendency to obscure the photograph. Take your time, be thorough, and make sure that you are getting high quality photographs so that we can properly document the scope of the damage for the insurance company so the adjuster can make a proper evaluation. So this right here, you see these lines? Yeah. This is thermal cracking. And the reason this is thermal cracking is because creases actually happen in the top like three quarters of an inch. I was gonna ask. See how this is all low? Yeah. Anything that's further down than three quarters of an inch mm -hmm. is either mechanical damage or thermal cracking, one or the other, because wind will actually lift the shingle mm -hmm. and fold it. Now this particular one, the, the wind is actually starting to crease it here, yeah. but it hasn't creased the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So this isn't actually wind damaged 
Mm, actually, this one I would write up as wind damage because that crease is fairly profound, yeah. but not this down here. It's just that little piece. Mm -hmm. And what's the cause of the thermal? Thermal damage is just poor ventilation. Gotcha. We live in a world with the sun mm -hmm. and the sun is hot yeah. and the roof gets really, really hot in the summer. That and just happens over, over just, year yeah, year. it just heats them up. Heats them up, heats them up, and eventually you get thermal cracking. Um, if you put ridge vent on, that will improve the thermal efficiency of your roof and it will decrease the, the propensity for that to happen. Um, some roofs in some climates, you're gonna get it no matter what you do. Yeah. I mean, when you're down in Phoenix, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a bazillion damn degrees. Um, now, the other thing to note about thermal cracking though is Thermal cracking isn't wind damage, but thermal cracking will make the shingles more susceptible to wind damage. So what you can have over time is this shingle is thermal cracked right now, but wind starts working and it, it starts worrying it. And eventually this becomes a full on crease. And when it's actually creased and it's actually fractured, mm -hmm. now it's wind damage. It started as thermal, now it's wind damage. Now what'll happen is your adjusters not all of them, but some of them will argue, well, that's thermal cracking. And your answer is that was thermal cracking. Now it's a fracture. This, this is an example of where thermal cracking caused a failure in the shingle, by the way. And I know that because of two things. First of all, it's down more than three quarters of an inch. And second of all, you see how it's ragged? Mm -hmm. An actual wind crease is almost, it's not a perfectly straight line, but it's almost perfectly straight. Mm -hmm. And again, it's up here at the top. This is here because what happened is it thermal cracked and then the wind got it and tore it off. And so that's the telltale sign. So yeah, like this, this is all thermal cracking and degranulation. So anything, you said three quarters of the way? Pretty much about three quarters of an inch. Beyond that is almost always gonna be thermal cracking or mechanical. Yeah. Cause you could have something like somebody smashed it with an ax. Well, that's damage, but it's mechanical damage. Yeah. You know, uh, and if they deliberately smashed it with an axe, that's vandalism. Yeah. Which is a whole nother issue. <laughs> and can be covered, but you have to prove it wasn't the homeowner. And that's a conversation yeah. I don't ever want to be a part of. Getting an accurate count of the damage is essential. So this is how you do that. You literally count all the X's and all the slashes that you've put on a roof. Then you're gonna make a note on the roof itself, typically just down from the ridge, that indicates how much damage you found on the roof. That notation goes like this. F for front equals W for wind or H for hail, depending on what you have, equals the total amount of marks you've put on a roof. This is every shingle that is either fractured or pulled through. 30. And then in parentheses, it's going to be how many of those marks are X's. And these numbers are gonna vary from each roof. So your final notation is going to say front equals wind equals 30 total damaged shingles, 15 of which are fractured or missing. Getting photographs of the damage and of the count of damage on a roof is very important, both for our teams to work with and for the adjusters to make accurate decisions. So this is an important step, pay attention. The first thing you wanna do is go to your notation of damage. With your iPad in landscape mode, you will take a picture of the notation you made. That tells everybody which slope you're looking at. Then you're gonna get a picture that gives an overview of the damage on that slope. Still in, in landscape mode. You really want your photograph to show 
the slope and the extent of the damage. Once that shot's done, then you'll take up close photographs of the damage on the roof. And you'll really want to go shingle by shingle to do this. When you're photographing shingle by shingle your damage, you'll take a shot from about two feet away. And where necessary, you'll get a very up close shot to show what is actually damaged. In this case, a fractured shingle that is severely creased but not yet missing. We're gonna do one more over here. In this case, we have a fractured shingle that is actually splitting. And you'll want a picture that shows. That split. You'll repeat this on every slope. You'll start with the notation, then an overview, then the individual damage. You should do front, back, left, and right in that order every time. If you organize your pictures properly, it makes the job much, much easier for our estimating team. And frankly, it makes the job easier for the adjuster. And we don't need this to be a war. We should be cooperative. If we can make their job easier and help them make a more accurate and informed decision simply by organizing our photographs better, we absolutely should. Every roof has accessories, so you have to get an accurate accessory count on every roof. What specifically exists on each roof is going to vary from roof to roof. This particular roof has turtle vents, pipe jacks, there's an exhaust for the furnace water heater, and there's satellite dishes. The way to note those is by counting each one and then putting a mark next to it. So in the case of turtle vents, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven turtle vents. So next to one of those turtle vents, I'm going to write seven. And now when I take the photograph, which I will take from about here, I have clearly a turtle vent and the amount of turtle vents in the frame. So at a glance, both me and my production team can tell how many turtle vents are on this roof. You'll do the same thing for all your accessories. Get to the accessory, count how many of those types there are, and then put a mark of how many there are. In this case, two pipe jacks, one exhaust vent, two um, satellite dishes. Some examples of other accessories you might have on a roof would include 